Excuse me. Um, I have the honor every time we have a reading to welcome everybody. My name is Carol Minkiti, and my husband was Ifani Minkiti, who bought the store from Elizabeth uh, Solano, who uh, died some time ago, and then he died about three and a half years ago. And our family now own the store, me and my four children. So um, you've come to a wonderful place, as I'm sure you know. And he loved this place. He thought it was a sacred place. And he had so much confidence in poetry of bringing people together from all over the world. So I know you will enjoy this reading tonight. It's very special. And I just want to say kudos for James, our manager. And uh, he's great. And we're so happy to have him. And we have two interns from Bennington College. Uh, Lily and, uh, and Star. Star, excuse me, yeah. So welcome tonight, and there's lots of people on Zoom here. That's the Zoom camera. So welcome to you on Zoom. Thank you for coming. study was it 10 years ago 15 years ago yeah um, and the subject was prosody and theology he proposed it and I said what's that basically <laughs> the entire course explaining to me what that was and then to, to have uh, Chris involved is just such an honor and he and I are both huge fans of everything you do um, anyway and to be back in the Grolier I used to come here as a college student um, you mentioned Louisa. I remember the day I walked in here when my first book was published, and I, you know, said, where's my book? And Louisa said, ah, oh, it's up, what's your name? It's up there on that shelf, and, you know, you couldn't really see it up there, but it was a thrill, uh, nonetheless. And, um, yeah, so this place has been a really charged place for me in many ways. All right, first poem. This Pig Eye. 
This pig I live with really does hover over much of what I do and say. It's in the room I lie in daily when I try to tell myself the truth about deceit or what I read or just my being a jerk and lazy pissy. It brings to mind the swine within and out of sight. It's like a shadow and it's knowing how dark at heart I am in part. It loves the muck. I'm often in the sty and stink of me and my. It's like a household deity now whose name is mine to give and take back in vain. It's black and beautifully sketched by Baskin, in fact. As though he thought it a holy beast of sorts, a sacred cow or zen bull, someone was having trouble herding, its hooves delicate as a devil's prance, cloven above the heaven and hell of my head. Its law written in red biblical letters says, For me it seems specifically, Pig, poet, thou shalt not eat. <laughs> Go to it. <laughs> I guess maybe we should stand because, yeah, otherwise yeah. we're going to be on each other's laps. <laughs> Welcome everybody, thank you so much for being here, and um, such an honor to share space with Peter and Chris. I have some new poems um, that I'm going to start reading from, and um, it's great to, to celebrate Peter's book. Um, there was one that jumped out at me as a response to what we just heard, and so we'll start like that, like Christopher said, and um, I suppose what's inspiring to me about poetry and religion as well as the opportunity for a conversation, um, and maybe that's what we on for tonight. So this is another poem of maybe self-recrimination, a uh, poem about poetry, a poem with an animal in it, um, though I don't say what it is, maybe you'll, maybe you'll find out. Further proof. Deeper inside the new house than you yourself, more intimate with its vents and spoils, inevitable feet gossiping up and down the kitchen wiring, then still just long enough that you forget, blood fluttering with fresh disgust, God now of every harmless creek, all this listening without sight, all this discovery not yours, so no, you won't be able, unless this counts, to concentrate Though you'd hauled yourself awake at four, coffee machine hissing over promising, as if poetry were push-ups, not scratches in the dark at the joists. <laughs> and uh, this is the next volley that I'll send over to Peter. Um, this is called... Vespers by Scroll Glow. And hi to everybody on Zoom as well, including maybe my kids. <laughs> Vespers by Scroll Glow. I heard of a thing called redemption, which rested men and women. You remember I asked you for it, you gave me something else. That comes from Emily Dickinson. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> I ask for effortlessness. You gave me something else. Kids in bed, kitchen, a battlefield of crusted plates and dazed figurines. Asked for a feather of forbearance, even unto the internet hour. I ask for a night sky visible above the onslaught of facts. When I ask for silence, you gave me a friend. Ask for a sound for the pains starlight takes to reach our surfaces, tickling pond scum. You gave me something else. Asking for a friend, what unflinchingness falls to our children now? When should we tell them and how? I ask for more whiskey with my water, no ice, less weather a hiccup in the automated rain to hear them breathe, a feather of stick a feather of fuck it. I didn't ask for today, 
but you gave me another. Okay, so I'll, um, I'll read a poem about um, things you want and things you get. <laughs> This is actually, so a lot of this, this book's called Draw Me After, and the, um, from the, the cover you, you would reasonably, and the jacket copy, but just from the cover you would think that it has something to do with drawing, and um, poems that are about visual arts, and ekphrasis as we call it, word I don't really like, um, and that's true, um, but the epigraph of the book comes from well, the title of the book comes from Song of Songs. When at the beginning of Song of Songs, the mysterious male beloved appears, and the woman says, draw me after you, let us run. So it's this kind of great eros. Uh, so the, the beginning, the epic, the mini epic, or the narrative of, of eros. But in the epigraph, the epigraph that I've chosen for the book is, takes a, sort of raises it to a, another level, or a higher power of sorts, and it's from the uh, Kabbalistic, main Kabbalistic text, the Zohar, in which they take the, the biblical surface, the nar biblical narrative, and say, that's just, you know, like, that's a starter kit. That's not really what this is all about. And they crack it open, sort of cut kaleidoscopically, sort of D.H. Lawrence inside the pomegranate, and says, what is this really about? And so for that phrase, one of the many uh, commentaries that they offer about what that phrase, draw me after you, let us run, what does that mean? They say it's really about before God created the world, two or three thousand years before, um, there were just the 22 Hebrew letters <coughs> and these 10 cosmic spheres or channels of influence. And there were male letters and there were female letters. And it says each letter called saying, draw me after you, let us run. And that's sort of that principle of listening, of having the poem take shape by having the letters <coughs> listen to each other, as sort of Nate and I are trying to listen to each other now, is, is really kind of a, you know, a deep, both religious principle in this scheme, but also a very, to my mind, very literary. It's sort of my literary principle. Um, so that's how that um, drew out. Uh, drew out. And the poem I'm going to read is written to a sculpture by the, the artist Joel Shapiro, who's been one of my sort of art heroes for my entire adult life. And um, so this is actually describing uh, sculpt two sculptures of his, but you'll see it could be about anything. Oh, yes. Oh, no. Not this shadow longer than the joy, which is just that, yes, joy, and another collapsing into a crouch to hold on, or leap up to shout with more of that same uneasy, ecstatic moving. Why delight? Uh-oh. No. Not that, yes. That, no, yes. To seeing limb. Bronze beneath those sky blues is why. And then Nate mentioned the F word. So I couldn't resist. <laughs> Slightly longer poem, but one that picks up on that. Um, so I mentioned the letters. And in addition to having a number of poems about works of art like this one, um, scattered throughout this book is a series of poems about the Hebrew letters. And I don't want to explain too much about it except to say that you know, people always say you should write about what you know, you should write about your earliest memories, you should write about childhood experience, all that. My childhood, the, one of the most powerful experiences of my childhood was my first encounter with the Hebrew letters and some kind of frisson, some kind of, they hold something that you don't know yet. But seems like it's going to be great. And that feeling has been with me my entire life. I ended up moving to Jerusalem in my early 20s and spending a lot of time deep inside Hebrew literature and medieval literature, Kabbalistic literature. Anyway, at a certain point in the composition of this book, I thought, you know, 
Could I convey in English anything of the excitement? Could I translate, as somebody who translates a lot of actual poems, um, could I translate that experience of the thrill that Hebrew letters have given me for 40, 50, 60, I'm 65, so it's 60 years now. So that's what I tried to do with it, with these letter poems. So this is a poem called Kuf. They take all different associations with letters. You don't have to know anything. That's sort of, sort of one of the game prints constraints of the poems. You don't need to know anything about it. I'll just say that the letter Kuf, numerologically in Hebrew, means stands for 100. And you'll see at the end how that comes out. Fucked art thou with luck, O reader within the palace, within the palate, within the disquiet, within, who tilts his letters into the light of the minds, muttering unto itself, releasing their sounds to the whirlpool fierce of an ear to draw creations in, who brings forth a kiss of circumference. The scripts hooked and loosened and linking through moths of minutes and months like wind out of a god whose name is gone. Fuck it and lucky art thou in the wind, moving marjoram into the mint, the fuzz and down of one grazing the raised ribs of the other, the essence is born, pheromones suddenly wafting, your eye catching the gradient greens and vein-like patterns the gray stubble of sage's tongue, Thick oregano's glister and whirl, stalks of thyme spiking the air on a kitchen porch or distant slope, its lavender flower lit in June. The blue film of night's end, rolling into white near dawn, the light by which you know a friend, the ancients explain, from six feet off, or a wolf from a dog. The pulse of morning bougainvillea, its papery bracts in a breeze-like prayer, its bezeled ruby beginnings morphing into <coughs> pinks and magentas to come, cream-tipped corollas on perfect display, style and stigma sheathing the anter, and then creeping Christian's dusty, dusky luster in the shade at noon, almonds swelling jade droops into the sinking summer pomegranate's garnet, pendant, containing, against the green of its archer stretch six hundred seeds dark with light, glinting through the cracks of its skin. Fucked art thou and lucky, who translates it into the day as blessed. So blessed as in blasted in a way art thou, in whom this knowing is strengthened in bringing you down to sinews of creaking knees, wrestling the gust of a given moment's giving like vapor and strangely grateful. Blessed art thou whose petitions are curses, whose fuck touches an innermost chamber, waking the letters from their slumber. Blessed the consonants funneling vowels and scriptures offering. Blessed the spirits unfurling within a word set or typed or scrawled as not quite deciphered codes of soul. Blessed even the stink and politic rot of the day's pronouncement on high. Liver of the blaspheming Jew, gall of goat and slips of you, and in action as evil. The concrete Lego-like bunker and tower, bunker and tower, barbed wire cabbage and vines, shadows gliding as crows fly across the road to the holy of hills and prefab shacks, from which herd like thugs emerge, watching and then descending through a slope stepping prance, fringes trailing, their dance sick with a stiffened faith, wicking and blotching their map of state like a cancered scan, eating away at its language and letters as one yields gun or none or bone, where lips meet and part in the bee of all that's brutal and also insidious in a possibly pointless battle, evoking the hundred blessings the rabbis say need to be uttered daily, reading the number, mea, hundred, into the word for what, ma, what does becoming your God ask of you, Deuteronomy 12, 10, 12, and blessed is never quite knowing exactly what those blessings are.
as a poem for the situation today in Israel, Palestine. Mm -hmm. Even though it was written four years ago. Forgive me, Nate, before you start. Uh, on my scorecard, we've had two rounds so far. Peter to Nate. Nate to Peter. All right. I think this is my second, right? Yeah. This is, okay. Yeah. This is the third inning? Fourth inning? I think it's the, the bottom of the third, second. The bottom of the second. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm sure we're all wondering that. Yes. Yeah. 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 There might be a pitching change. But some innings point. go faster than others. We're thinking of a hockey game with three periods. And nobody, nobody's got hurt yet. That's true. That's true. Um, so P Peter mentioned um, that I, I sought him out to study when I was in divinity school. And I just remember being so excited when I, when I finally found you. It was almost too late. I was all at the end of my program. But um, I had gone to divinity school kind of mostly to figure out if I could be a poet and be a minister um, together, uh, but then inside that there was this question about um, what I was feeling uh, in the sounds of poems and why that was so important to me uh, spiritually. And um, and Peter was the only one who seemed to be equally interested in that in the whole uh, in the whole New Haven area. Um, and so I just thought I'd read one or two poems. Um, that go back to that time. My good friend Russ is here from New Haven as well. Um, these are kind of short devotional poems, um, and then I'll, I'll read a newer one as well. This one's called Dare. Dare. Not this time to infer, but to wait you out between regret and parking lot, somewhere in the day like a dare. Salt grime and the food cart's rising steam. At Prospect Street, a goshawk, huge and aloof, picking at something, nested in twigs and police tape. For a while, we all held our phones up. It is relentless, the suddenness of every other song creature, neighbor, as though this life would prove you only by turning into itself. I love that um, dichotomy that Peter set up in the last poem about knowing and not knowing. Um, and, you know, of course that has such a rich history in, in lyric poetry and um, like I sometimes wonder if that's what we go to 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 religion for as well, and um, and whether religion that's fruitful um, actually tries to make use of that. Um, this is a little poem called "The Choice." To stand some time outside my faith, to steady it, caught and squirming on a stick, up to mine's inviting light and name it for all its faults and facets, or keep waiting to be claimed in it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do one more, if that's OK. Um, this is a, a newer poem. I have found that um, since, um, since having kids, um, kind of acts of devotion and um, the whole nature of devotion changes a little bit. Um, and um, this is one that I wrote um, right before COVID that uh, took on new meanings um, afterwards. We, we lived in California before we moved back here. And this is set in Joshua Tree. It's called Autofocus. It's a little bit longer, just a little over two pages. Autofocus. It's a road trip poem. Before we saw mountains, the windmills, their stillness enormous, then nudged into work, blade lifting from bone and beginning to turn, until in the rearview mirror, the whole desert valley spun silently. 
But we were aimed for town, souped up rangers and Durangos stretching as high as houses, and the homemade billboard build the wall propped at the traffic light, so we had to stop and swallow it. A meek sun's underlid meted out the foreseeable when we finally reached the national park, well equipped and locatable, gratingly obvious to God. Acres of yuccas, like stars, stunted rebounds off the sand to the Spanish desert daggers, while Mormons camping among the spiky limbs conjured Joshua, waiting on the Lord, holding his sickle sword aloft. So cold, we never left our car, except to scramble up Skull Rock, where rain Centuries of unimaginable rain had worn two holes like sockets. See us lifting high our daughter, holding our smiles for a stranger in the picture arriving on your phone. And back of us, unblinking, the stone eyes containing everything that would happen after. one that's um, also about kind of poetry that's in not quite knowing. I mean, there's, there's Keats's uncertainty and negative capability, which is a very profound thing. Um, and um, <coughs> one of the things I, I really like about Nate's poetry and Light from his, his very first work on is his ability to, for all of his immersion, immersion isn't in the word, I mean, his vocation as a, as a minister, and, but his immersion in the, the stuff of theology and doctrine, and uh, but also people and his congregations, um, is his ability to sort of downshift from the overdetermined vocabulary of religion to the very underdetermined and incohate um, syntax of poetry, of life. What is, you know, what, how does that all come together to, to anything that might mean anything to us? And that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a profound, beautiful thing and a really, really difficult thing. And um, I think for poets like us both, involved with religious things in, from very different angles, uh, I'm not involved institutionally in that way, but I do spend my life, um, a lot of my life, with religious texts every day and love them and just, you know, kind of ridiculous how much, how bottomless that hunger is for that. Um, so I'll read a poem about, it's, well, really, almost any poem in this book is about, about this, but it's about this translating from one plane of reality to another. So this is also in, in one of the poems about art, um, a draw me after poem. <clears throat> it's from the central series of the book, which is based on drawings by the artist Terry Winter. And he invited me to write about his drawings, and that sort of really gave me the seed for the whole sort of unifying um, theme or motive in this book. Um, so this is about one of his drawings, but you don't need to know what it looks like. And in fact, in the book, there's no reproduction of it. This writing's on and off the wall and tells us what it is and why we're so intent on understanding a layered saying that seems to say it all and nothing in particular, just like everything seen by those who know it shows at best the whole in part that grows with the telling and spell. <clears throat> in part that grows with the telling and spell dangling in between like someone listening into a certain sort of uncertainty, speaking of uncertainty as a song of songs tangled truly in our being, let along a luminous line singed and fringed within the singing, seeing, seeing us through. And then a very short poem, an actual sort of traditional, conventional translation. Um, this is a translation of a poem by Yehuda Amichai. Um, 
I don't know if he ever read it earlier, but he, he was everywhere. One of the great, great poets of the second half of the 20th century. This is actually a poem about translation that he never published in his lifetime. It's in the Beinecke Library in his papers. He's got a couple of poems about translation. And his archive shows that, in fact, a lot of his earlier poems, he grew up in Germany until the age of nine, then he came to Palestine, Israel, became Israel. He composed quite a few of his most famous poems at the beginning of his career in German initially. And then halfway through the composition process, switched to Hebrew. I mean, it's a kind of beautiful, wild thing, you know, that, that mixture, that, that sort of uncertainty at the root of these poems that for Hebrew speakers have become sort of national, iconic poems. Anyway, so it's a four-line epigram. In fact, I know because I knew Yehuda, and I know his, that his favorite poets were the medieval poets that I've translated. <coughs> And so he's taking the form of the epigram directly from the 11th century Spain, Hebrew poetry, Muslim Spain, and then he turns it into this kind of layered thing like the last time I read. I went out toward my life, my will set strong, and raised to the power of 70 tongues. The gates were guarded, it seemed, by translators moving among them. They helped but now they're gone, and my heart returns alone to its first home. There's another line in Peter's new book that talks about the difference between rehearsal and real living, right? Is that what he's saying? Yeah. And, uh, and this kind of reading format is, is a little bit like that, um, except once. Whether, whether we're alive or only rehearsing, it's about a radio show. <laughs> but I will right, read it. Right, yeah. yeah. Um, Maybe I will read it. So this poem um, that I'm going to read always kind of reminds me of that. Um, it's called The Proof Cloth. It's about the first few months of, um, of parenthood. The Proof Cloth. What she needed most, she couldn't stomach much of. By month four, each dish towel and napkin in the house, even newly washed, smelled of the milk she'd gummed down hourly, then, smiling wider, spit back up as if already she'd caught her father's penchant for sudden second thoughts. One afternoon, alone, furtive as a teenager, I slipped one of the cloths inside a Ziploc, sealed and hid the bag on a shelf in our bedroom closet. The next day, while she slept, small inhalations could incarnate on demand my favorite inch of skin between her chin and neck. Judge not or judge that part of love which, when adrenaline and worry boil off, still wants some remnant, relic to itself, elbows its way among the orthodox for a glimpse of proof's flimsy fabric. Tonight, the monitor's grainy military idiom splays her on her side again, face hidden. We lay wait in bed, <coughs> weighing the brief relief of confirming that she's still breathing against the catastrophe of her waking up and make the incorrect and only choice. You tiptoe in to check, wool socked, but the door still creaks. Accessory, I hang behind and hear the first cry happening twice and watch the tiny animal eyes flare open. All right, we're in the, the fourth and final yes. inning. <laughs> so Nate and I agree that the, the last round we just have some concluding poems, poem or two. Um, but in fact, I will respond to your uh, your radio thing. And with Chris, how could I, how could I resist? So I'm going to end with two short poems. Um, <clears throat> this poem is called, Can You Hear Me? 
It's a kind of a trick poem you'll see, uh, in which is better in a larger, with a larger audience. Um, I was like this. Can you hear me there at the back? Mm -hmm. Yes? Testing, one, two, three. This is working? Great. Everything's working? Great. Just checking. You never know what exactly is getting through, do you? It's a little like the day years ago. I was on a radio show. Soundcheck. That was its name. Though at the time, I didn't know what it was called. So when I was sent into the studio, and the host looked up and said, just follow my lead. This is sound check. I kept staring, slightly terrified into his eyes, trying to hear if we were live or only rehearsing, which is, in its way, always <laughs> it's a true story. I was actually on the show with two other people, and I wrote to the first one, and I write, are we live, or is this a sound check? And he circled live, with a look of terror in his eyes, at me, who he thought was an intelligent guy. And I didn't believe him, so I turned to my left, and I asked the person on my left the same thing. <laughs> Um, it was a show in New York, sound check. Uh, he's the guy still on the air, but he doesn't have that show anymore. All right, last poem I'm going to read is um, kind of a tribute to what we're, what we're doing, the kind of conversations that Nate and I have had over the years, um, the kind of conversation that I hope the letters are having in, in these poems. And, um, and really, I think the way poets think, that letters are hooking up. Uh, all across the, the centuries and across languages. Um, the, the trick or the sort of game I played myself with these letter poems is that I would think about the letter for a long time and read about them and mostly reading kind of all kinds of medieval things in Hebrew. And, but I wouldn't, I would try not to force a poem. It's, you know, nobody's waiting for these poems. Like, in fact, probably you shouldn't be writing these poems because really nobody's going to care about these poems in English and nobody's going to get them and you're just scratching this itch that you need to scratch. And so if it takes me six months between, it's 22 letters in Hebrew, if it takes me six months between poems, who cares? It's something to look forward to. And kind of mysteriously they emerged and to my surprise, the editors took them in magazines, non-Jewish editors. I say, are you sure you're not just? But they, they seem to have had a life of their own. But the main thing is that when I sat down to write, no matter what I had read, or I would try not to force it. And just, I wouldn't write until I felt like a certain kind of urgency, in the same way that you write any, any sort of poem. Um, and so when I sat down to write this poem, which is called Vav, Vav is the sixth letter. Um, the letter means all kinds of things, doesn't matter what it means. Um, I had no idea what I was going to write it on. I, maybe I was looking at the shape of the letter. It looks a bit like a slightly arthritic index finger. Uh, straight lines sort of bent at the top. And it ended up being a poem about the great critic and also poet um, Jeffrey Hartman. Many of you probably know something about Jeffrey amazing scholar of Wordsworth, sort of the scholar of Wordsworth, the second half of the 20th century, German Jewish refugee, came to America, spoke English with a heavy German accent until the very, very end, he had a long beard, long white beard later in life, and uh, Chris and I are, were both very close to Harold Bloom, and Harold and Jeffrey were very close in a kind of rivalrous way, and to get um, Jeffrey's goat, Harold used to call him the Ayatollah. <laughs> and uh, Jeffrey did not really appreciate that very much. Um, but there was something, there was that side of Jeffrey, but there was another side of him which is incredibly gentle. And he was, he was an amazing reader. And so the poem that I ended up, I ended up writing was three years after Jeffrey died. So there's no reason why he would pop up in my mind as I was starting to write. I was at his funeral. We were friends, not close, close friends, but we were sort of intellectually involved. I read his books in, in manuscript. And it ended up being a poem about Jeffrey, and a poem about reading, and a poem about interpretation, and a poem about what's on the page and what's not on the page, and all that. 
This upright letter bows its head ever so slightly out of humility, much like Jeffrey, toward the page. It's fixed itself, too, as though by a hook, or being hooked, really a summoning from within it or him to listen hard to what's barely there, and maybe not quite yet between the lines, to sit, taking a stand and read, learning straightness and when to bend. So we come, not to the end, but once again and again to end. And Nate. Score is tied, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this has been so much fun. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And I think if you're able to stick around, we'll do a little conversation, right, Chris, about, about uh, poetry and religion and whatever else comes up. So, yeah, this question of, of waiting, of waiting for the right moment, of, of uh, not writing, almost as a form of writing, um, all things that um, have been useful and, and pressed upon me in, in different parts of my life. And um, I thought I'd just read this this last one as a closer. It's called The Pokemon Go People. <laughs> and um, I spent some time uh, in this little town in Connecticut. And uh, it was during, it's hard to remember back like pre-2020, but it was a really popular game that people of all ages played and you would show up at a different spot and you would, you would capture uh, different different creatures and um, and this was the this was the thing um, when I spent some time in this town and, and the the people who lived there were not so fond of of the, of the folks coming in from out of town but I found myself taking their side and so this is this is my my defense of them maybe um, the Pokemon go people not pretending to be shopping they can they canvas cobblestone water street near-sighted as beach sweepers, their devices feeling ahead for which alleyway or corner of a yard might sprout a Snorlax, a purple Aerodactyl. These are the Pokemon Go people, explains a villager to her guest, careful not to point as one group passes their jean shorts to mid-shin, arms arabesqued with dates or skewered hearts, some steering strollers. Scattered among the 18th century colonials, the Improvement Association's clapboard plaques remember Hale, ship captain, and Stuart, joiner, each calling stenciled right beneath the name. In this new life, vocations not so certain, assignments can vibrate at any time, the location of a needed creature flash, then disappear, you almost have to be waiting there already, disconsolate after a day of nothing as light drains at the former hot spot in Cannon Square. When two wild Pikachu clamber over the rocks, the woman shrieks and punches her partner to make sure he'd seen a postcoital quiet on their drive back home to Pocketuck. <laughs> Do you want to bring a chair up here, or you want to, uh, unless you're going to do this? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I have to speak up. I don't know if we can. Peter, can I just make an unscheduled request? Would you come and give me the poem? I, I thought you were leading into it several times, but about um, form number four, on page 63, it's the drawing, the poem. How does this drawer? Yeah. That one? Yeah. This is just a, a bonus for me. Oh, thank you. This is the this is kind of the coda to the whole drawing sequence of the Terry Winters poems. How does this drawer hold it all within a space along a trace left on a surface marked as such the world is drawn with water from a well and then a gun or wagon now alone against collateral or interest on a bank account and maybe a 
conclusion. Drapes are drawn so light gets in, or it doesn't. Someone draws attention, drawing even in a race he's drawn to, drawn aside or else asunder. Thus the luck of the draw, we call it, has the drawing. Thus the luck of the draw, we call it, has the drawn card, drawn cheers or blood, a breath or blank or cello's bow. And so he drew a bath or on a pipe. If she drew fire and ducked, the goose was shot and plucked and drawn as dawn drew near. They drew together playing on to a draw, drawn back and again to the drawn board in plans to hatch or hatches to sketch like poems. Yes, always more to draw on there with in the proverbial drawer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I would just like to, I'd like to throw out a, just a general question, and it has to do with this combination of uh, religious words, religious language in some sense, religious texts, religious devotion, religious this, religious that. Um, James and I were speaking at the beginning before. Uh, Oh, it's right. Um, has there ever been a time that sort of has suppressed or avoided or forgotten um, the beauty of religious search, preoccupation, interest, reassurance, whatever in the world we do with it? I, I'm, I, it seems to me the world is waiting for not necessarily these poems, although that too, but a rediscovery of this zone of interest and uh, music and accompaniment and whatever it is. Uh, how do you poets, you two particularly, specifically, um, where, where are we? Where are we in what feels like an eclipse of religious belief and credibility, not to mention the basics like church going, but reference and the whole surround James, can we pass this around? Yeah, sure. Okay. Be better, right? um, yeah, so the question of kind of where we are, uh, which is a great big question to start off with. Um, I mean, I'm struck thinking about Peter's work and thinking about uh, the work of so many writers who I like as it's helpful to have something to respond to. It's helpful to have a, a medium or an environment to bounce things off of and, and find resistances in and find um, places where you, know, you, you find pleasure and, and meaning. And I guess, I guess that's what um, tradition is for me. Um, it's certainly not something to inherit unthinkingly, um, but when I think of poetic tradition and religious tradition, um, I don't know, it's something to wrestle with. It's something that's that's there, and yes, has done uh, a ton of damage in all sorts of ways, and we need to continue to, to name those things. Um, but also, um, I, I guess I feel like the tradition that I'm interested in has always been one where you know the wrestling has happened the whole way along. Um, <laughs> so wrestling. I mean, that's. I, I live half the year in in Jerusalem, and um, we were just having a drink. Our friend Jonathan Wilson, the novelist in the back row there, um, we were talking about. I said, you know, something about Jerusalem. He said, yes, not Israel. You know, it's like, do you live in Jerusalem? Do you live in Israel? What's cool? What's not cool? What's? And I do think of myself as living in Jerusalem. But when you say wrestling, that's what the word Israel etymologically means to wrestle with God. That's Jacob changes his name to Israel. That's that's an amazing story, right? That that confrontation with the man, the angel, whatever it is. That wrestling is what this preoccupation of, the, of both of ours with the Judeo-Christian, I think, um, line of of search, of inquiry, of of textual engagement, of find, trying to make sense of things. Right? That's really what it is trying to make sense of things. Um, and so I find that very comforting, that, that 
that at the heart of it is a struggle. Like that's that's actually the goal is just to keep on keep on wrestling. Um, but in terms of you know where poetry meets it and the sort of suspicion that religion is with is regarded with, let's say more generally culturally and obviously so much in America religion associated with the right, with the kind of narrowness of focus and in Israel also. Um, but it's not a new thing. Right? Samuel Johnson railed against metrical devotion. Okay? This adds nothing to, to the mind to, to, to put, put one's, and Auden cautioned against the bearing of soul and verse. There's a lot of really smart, good people who said, you know, there are better things poets can do than, than write about religion. Although, George Herbert and a lot of other people said, said well, that, never mind that, I've got something to say. Um, but a poet like Richard Wilbur, who's very far from both of us in, in terms of poetics, said, um, I think it was in an interview once, he said, you know, I, I annoy a lot of people by saying that I think the basic poetic impulse is religious. Because poets are always as free thinkers, always trying to deny that and politically distance themselves from religion. And he said, but what are poets, what do they talk about most of the time? All poets, of all stripes, they're always trying to make connections and find unlikely linkages in the world, a kind of hidden network of language, linkages. He said, that, as he put it, is a fundamentally religious impulse. I mean, whether you're a Buddhist or you're reciting the Hebrew liturgy every day about the network of tubes in our, in our body that keep us going, or the hundred blessings I read about in that Kuf poem that you're supposed to recite daily, the hundred blessings, and the word for blessings and curses in Hebrew, they can, one can mean the other often. Um, I think they are fundamentally mixed. They've always been mixed. And it's sort of like, where is the larger, the larger culture now in America is to the right. Religion is this narrowing thing. But as Nate said, Look back, it's, you don't, it, it would be utter foolishness to throw out all that meat on the bones of all those centuries. All that wisdom which is universal, which, which is, I mean, that, that stuff has just fed me constantly. Um, in the postmodern period of sort of erasure of depth and suspicion of of depth and meaning and all those traditional things, and then we, we lost a lot of that. But there, I think there is a kind of cultural swing back towards a sense of, okay, maybe the old modernist or old older traditional ways are not viable. But Wallace Stevens, Wallace Stevens says in The Man with the Blue Guitar, say what it is Say what it is that you see in the dark, that it is this or that it is that, but do not use the rotted names. That's it in a nutshell for me. Like, we all we all have we all see things in the dark. We you know sometimes we don't come out of the dark. We all see things. We all are as poets, as readers of poetry, as readers of any kind of literature, we're looking for some sense way in which words will help us make some sense of that, make meaning of it. That for me is a kind of religious question. Stevens is saying, as poets, as writers, your job is, is not to use the rotted names. Your job is to, to, to kill those names in a certain sense, to clear a space for a new way of making those meaning. But the task, I think, is the same task. I don't, I don't fundamentally see it as changing. And I know as a writer, I drew, have drawn, I think, my the greatest both solace and also sources of fuel from those older religious texts, which I go back to all the time. And sometimes you have to, you have, sometimes you have to knock them. You have to, you have to bang them around to get them to make sense and mean something again. You have to, re, you have to be pretty violent with them. That's what translation is. There's a kind of violence that has to be done in order to keep something alive. It has to change.
the subject. And I'm particularly interested not just what the poets see, but what you imagine other people see. Do, do, you, do you see a hungry audience? I don't mean audience, a hungry, a hungry culture out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to just respond to the Stevens bit first, because I think that's such an interesting example. Um, I mean, Stevens' whole thing was that, you know, religion had had lost its usefulness, right? And poetry came to replace that. Um, I love do not use the rotted names. To me, Stevens gets quite doctrinal in his own way in the longer poems. And it's an interesting kind of example of the way secularism can, can you know, be just as narrow-minded, right? Um, and... Um, I mean, I love like the, the late poems that are kind of full of the mystery that I think he was feeling and that I think I think poets are invested in, um, regardless of their religious affiliations. Um, I think, you know, I've, I've landed at this really interesting congregation right now um, where we listen to poetry uh, quite often in our church. Um, and we are a non-creedal congregation, so there's no there's no overall doctrine that everyone knows that we have in common. Um, you know, I'm not even sure if theology is the right way to describe what we hold in common. Um, it's really a space, and it's a time of day, and it's a practice, and it's you know it's often listening, and um, I think that happens in small ways, in small places, um, in every state I've lived in. And um, so often that's not, that's not the picture of religion that you read about in the New York Times, um, and it's not the picture of religion that you hear about on the right either. Um, but it's happening. Do you want to continue the conversation between you and you? With, with, maybe without poetry, or is it, or is it the time when we, as on the radio, we say we go to callers? Um, you, your call. Um, let's go to callers. Uh, are, we, are we ready to broaden out this poets, poetry, and religion conversation? Um, I'd love to keep any questions or comments very brief and see if we can draw the poets into them. Please. Um, thank you. Um, first, gratitude for the um, incredible personal share that you both made. Um, connecting your own lived experience to your words is, is really powerful to me. I'm interested in the 20, 30 years that separate each of you as a measure of time in the evolution of religion and poetry. Um, as you as you each go forward to write those words that are either urgent or not urgent, um, Peter, I love the way you describe that urgency. What what are the challenges today that are different? And Peter, I'm looking to you in particular, but as a young poet, when you first published your first works, Nate, as a young poet publishing his works, what's changing in the filter? And how is the filter influencing what you can and can't get published? Sure. Wonderful question. Peter, do you want to throw out, give us a date and tell us about your thinking? <laughs> um, boy, I to keep that short. Um, the bottom line is that well, right over here, I just looked over there was while well, they were speaking, there was Dome of the Hidden Pavilion by James, new poems by James Tate, who died a couple years ago. So Jim was my teacher college. Um, I was at Hampshire College. He was teaching at UMass. And it, I um, he arranged a little workshop. I took a couple of modern and contemporary poetry classes with him. And I learned so much from that guy. Just talk. We'd sit in the car after class and talk. And he, he gave me John Wiener's picture. I have a picture of my desk of John Wiener's at the grill here. I've been there for 30, 40 years now. And I learned so much from just he read a list once. He came to class one day. He read a list of poets born after 1943 or something like that. 
I mean, you could say, pedagogically, he was just killing time, right? Um, but I thought, why, why did he do this? And, and when he got to the word, the name John Wieners, how many people in the audience have read John Wieners? I'm just curious. And so those of you who haven't read John Wieners, amazing, amazing poet, Boston poet. Um, and that, his voice changed when he read that. When he, and I hadn't heard of that poem. I asked him afterwards, who's that, who's that poet, John Wieners? He said, I'll show you. Next week he brings in, he gives me a gift of privately printed things. So I spent a lot of time talking to people like James Tay and Jack Gilbert was another one of my informal teachers. I dropped out of college and went to live in Greece with Jack Gilbert. And I understood, I love those guys. They were just so generous to me. You know, I learned so much. But I understood I was not them. I came from a completely different culture. And I understood that there was some sort of Jewish element in me that was very deep and that had to find, if I was going to do anything as a poet, that's the direction I had to go in. I didn't even know what that direction meant, really. But, so that was age 21, 22. And, and really that was what drove me, I went back to Jerusalem, I realized I lived as a kid, but in school, but I forgot it. That sort of intuition, and I can remember two specific times, very specific instances, felt that. Learning Hebrew, sort of opening that door, it was like a let's make a deal thing. Door number three, I'm going to go with that one, no matter what's behind it. And um, that's, my poetry really did come out of that. I needed to find out what was on the Judeo side of that Judeo-Christian tradition that English poetry is, and I love the Christian side of it, totally. I have many Christian, early Christian poems in my head. Um, so following that out, backwards in, in time was, was really critical for me, and it's something I've continued to do. Um, that 30-year gap that you mentioned is, I feel like there's a 30-year gap between me and myself, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, like the, the Pokemon, you know, I don't know anything about that. <laughs> that was two years ago. <laughs> so well, then they explain the rest of that. Um, gosh, I mean, I don't, I don't know how personal I need to get into, uh, into my own story. I mean, I, I was really fortunate to have a mother who uh, who writes, and so she, she would paste little poems in our, our bathroom mirror and um, and just leave, leave us alone and let us read those. And um, so I definitely grew up in a, a household that was literary, and um, I'm so, so grateful for that. Um, I don't know, to get back to your question a little bit, I mean, I think... Um, you know, the internet <laughs> has changed things, you know, incredibly sizably, and um, I, th I just think things have have opened up um, in um, overall beneficial ways, and um, I think in in huge ways. And um, count, the, count the ways. Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess, just thinking about if you want to get your poems published, um, if you want to connect with poets, who, if you want to find out about poets, I, I feel like that's got to be easier now than it than it was. Um, I feel like there's less like cultural, institutional kind of people or barriers standing in the way, and um, and I guess overall that seems good. It's also just very confusing, right? It's just it's. It's overwhelming. It's bewildering, and um, I personally am a little glad that I kind of, you know, I found out who I loved before like Twitter existed, because um, I, I just would imagine. Your marriage now or poets? I'm sorry. You're talking about your marriage or poets? <laughs> yeah, yeah, both, both. Um, but but especially especially like the the poetic influences because um, it. There's just, it's such a soup as well right now. Thank you. Please. Next. Next in the barber chair. Yeah. Wait, you have another. I, I can't resist if, if I've got one more. But I've already <laughs> taken uh, my, my, more than my share. Double dipping, let that be a challenge to others. Or should we, 
Go for it. Okay. I just, keep it keep it brief. Thank you. Um, if you look at the pre-modern church, Hildegard um, taking Matthew Fox's online course and thinking about the beauty beauty of her poetry, how does religious poetry today stack up? to the 10th century, the 12th century, the, 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 the pre-modern church. I mean, give us examples of other religious poetry. Yeah, I mean, I think in, in um, obscure corners, um, devotional poetry is quite strong. Um, one of my favorite poets is named Fanny Howe, and she is around, um, and I mean she's been writing in Boston, Cambridge for I don't know 50 years, right? So um, I think it's it's been there, um, and it's um, maybe maybe it benefits from um, being a little less in the cultural spotlight because of you know because religion institutionally is a little less relevant. Um, I think. I think art always exists on the fringes, right? So, um, I don't know. On the other hand, poets need to have ways to live. And, you know, patronage and a relationship with a church was was quite helpful. Um, so, we don't really do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say, as a, from a totally amateur standpoint, um, Franz Wright appealed to me strongly under that heading, in this very room. I, I, I used to describe, I, to his face, I would describe Franz Wright as a man who, <clears throat> if, the, if the Catholic Mass hadn't existed, he would have invented it. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, I, I could never have imagined something so powerful as friends breaking bread together praise of the Almighty. I mean, it was, I'm, I'm, that's a bad paraphrase, but Franz was so profoundly uh, religious. And in, in a wonderful way, I thought. So a lot of the, uh, a, a lot of my translation life, my, my time as a poet spent at translating poems from Hebrew or, and Arabic also. The English has been involved with medieval uh, Hebrew poetry, Hebrew poetry from Muslim Spain. 11th, 12th, 10th, 11th, 12th century. And in addition to a really developed sort of secular poetry about everything, everything that human beings do, um, there was also an incredibly developed uh, liturgical poetry. And poet, poet, poets were writing poems for every Sabbath, for every Shabbat. They were writing poems for every Jewish holiday. And they're writing new poems in the same way that Bach is composing music for the church in Leipzig. And that tradition had been going on for actually five, six hundred years already in the history of Judaism, where poets are composing for the synagogue, and the good ones, people are coming to hear them every week. What is the poet going to do? Because that was the sort of privileged art form at the time. And they were they were performative things. And Especially in the 10th, 11th century, the, that tradition turned inward in a kind of very profound and to us modern way about the interiority. And the poems that were written, some of the poems that were written then are still very much part of the prayer service today in synagogues all around the world. Different synagogues have different poems that they incorporate, just like you're talking about with your congregation, which is that the poems you're incorporating were not written for the liturgy. But now, as you said with the internet, these things are open. Those borders have been broken down. And so what difference does it make whether we call it liturgical, not liturgical? It suits the moment. And so those are some of the, I remember when I first went to, to Jerusalem and studied some of this stuff. And the, I remember the first little exercise I wrote in a class, for a, I was supposed to write about a liturgical poem in Hebrew. And I was really just sort of getting my, reviving my Hebrew. And the teacher afterwards calls me up to the front of the class. He'd stay after and talk to you. Uh, wait, that hasn't happened for a long time. Um, and he said, look, you completely misunderstood. Um, I asked you to write about a non-liturgical poem. And you wrote about a liturgical poem. 
but it was very interesting what you wrote. And he said, just keep going like this, you'll get farther than anybody else in the class this way. And the reason I wrote about this liturgical poem was because I thought the liturgical poem was speaking for me, personally. I have nothing to do with the synagogues, I have to do with my sort of psychological state. And in a sense, I think these poets, they understood all that. When they're writing for the synagogue, they understand that they're writing for all kinds of people and for situations that are not limited by the, the, the walls um, that they're surrounded by. So having kind of, that poetry imprinted itself on me very, very deeply. But that, that also becomes a kind of rotten name. So for me, kind of challenge was, has been to, how do I translate the power, my experience of that poetry as being the most powerful, among the most powerful poems I've ever read, into a vocabulary that now. Uh, over to you, Nate, on the subject of religious, religious poets and poetry today. I appreciate you all sitting tight in the hot room, too. Um, I, so, yeah, one interesting thing for me is, is there is a, like a subculture in this country, at least, and I think, I think probably in, and I'm just speaking about Christianity right now, I think probably in, um, um, Christian cultures across the world, there is like a liturgical poetry subculture. Uh, folks, folks who write specifically poems, um, you know, for church, and I usually am not as fond of those, right? So it's the, the poems I was talking about before that that I love to have us read in church. They're they're just literary poems, and and we kind of import them, and I wonder about that that difference. Um, there's something about, like, this is, you know, the intended final form of your poems in some way is a book, right? And so we wanted to encourage rereading and repeated engagement. And um, and so that, I guess that's always the tension with liturgical art is, you know, does it bear repeated, repeated engagement, right? Um, and the poem that I've that I've really discovered that work in church. It's sort of like a miracle to find them because, like, they're good and they and they work. <laughs> I need a few. Or one yeah, or um, so we just read a few last Sunday. Um, we read one. We read an excerpt from *The Stars* by Elliot Weinberger, um, which was pretty amazing. Um, we read uh, a poem by Pablo Medina uh, about Epiphany because it was Epiphany last week. Um, yeah. Richard Wilbur has a few. I mean, rhyme is helpful sometimes. Um, so you can latch on to it and connect with it. I think one of the one of the things I found in the, in the Hebrew medieval poetry that makes liturgical poetry last, as they, they, they said, they have to be read either every week. Some of them are every day. I had a, a dentist in Jerusalem. The religious guy, and as he's working on my teeth, you know, that way the dentists have of asking you complicated questions while they have you know, sharp objects in your mouth. Um, and he, you know, he was asking what I was translating, and I said, well, you know, you read this every day at uh, synagogue, it's at the front of the prayer book. And he said, you don't want to know what I think about synagogue, I'm not reading. Um, but these things are there, and they have, they, they're still there, and there's still people who are still reading them a thousand years later. And they have to bear that repetition. And one of the things I, I find with the, the, the really powerful liturgical poems is, is they contain their, not exactly their negation, but they contain the undertow of religious feeling, which is to say they contain doubt, they contain skepticism, they contain anger, they contain contempt. It's like well, the Psalms. Yeah, but, but even more explicitly than the Psalms. Yeah. Even more. I mean, Ibn Gabi Rola, one of the great uh, 11th century poets, as a, a poem starts out, in, in my translation, uh, talking to God, before my being, your mercy came through me, bringing existence to nothing to make me. Which sounds like a great song of innocence. Praise God, you have done all this. But it could also be in the Neoplatonic scheme of things which he held to. The universe was perfect until spirit began to descend into matter by your design. You brought me a filthy, compromised, murky being into the world, destroying existence, bringing existence to nothing. To me. And he expects 
every worshiper in the synagogue to read that every week and cycle through these books. For the innocent reader, it's just a good praise. For the discerning reader, it's all that doubt and that ambivalence. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, one of the things that makes those poems and the poems that you're bringing into the congregation, makes them last better than repetition. Mm -hmm. One more invitation in the room. Please, Carol? Um, it seems to me that one of the things, because I have younger children and a younger generation, is that community is not being possible for them as it was when, I mean, as it is in the church or as it is in, and that they long for that and finding that. And that begins to develop relationships like, you know, that inspire a divine sense of who we are uh, just out of concern for one another and care for one another and love for one another. I mean, like he spoke about his children. I think those things come out of this living together, being together as community. And I think that community is more difficult now, especially during COVID. Community was difficult. And it's not seem as possible on the <coughs> internet as it is when we gather together as people, you know. I don't know, maybe I'm too naive about it, but I really feel that uh, that sense of coming together as human beings, that poetry can come out of that. I want to say amen, but I'd like to get Nate's sort of, would you paraphrase the question and maybe answer it, and then we will declare victory and go home. <laughs> so Carol was talking about the importance of community, and um, right above you is Robert Creeley, who loved to use the word company, mm -hmm. and um, certainly something that, you know, has sort of saved my life, I think, both in poetry and um, and in religious community sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's where you um, Well, just to echo what Carol said, in the sense that um, most books of poetry, over here we're not just sales, um, most books of poetry, you know, don't sell a lot of copies. And, uh, kind of, it's not a it's not a business, right? it's more of a charity. Um, but there are a lot of people at a lot of poetry readings tonight. They're just people, I know I've been struck throughout my life, how, how many people who are not, poets always say, oh, you know, who buys books of poetry? Only other poets. But I've been struck consistently in my life by how many people who are not, quote, professional or aspiring poets People who are doing other jobs, they've got their poems in that drawer, like that poem I read before. They got their poems in the drawer. They carry poems in their wallets by other people. There is this sense that poetry, even if it doesn't always do it, has the potential to do it. And that, you know, so that's a community that may not be reali a realized community, but it's a kind of, it's a, it's a, um, a community in potentia, right? And, and poetry does seem to have that power, and that's a kind of amazing thing. When you think about the, the economy we live in, the, the cultural climate we live in, that, that is still the case. You know, again, even if it doesn't always deliver, the promise of it still does seem to have that kind of resonance and sort of force field about it. I think that's a wonderful place to stop and um, count our blessings, so to speak, and uh, keep thinking about it. I'd love to hear from both of you again, and I'd love to, to play this game with other poets. So let's do it again. Absolutely. Thank you. Sir. by the poets and Christopher one more round of applause. We have some books for sale. Poets will be signing books and everyone can please move their chairs up against the wall. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.